Good evening. You're watching the news at 7.30 on ATV. I'm Edna Tse. And I'm Emily Sue. Here's a look at tonight's top stories. ICAC rejects claim that Hong Kong's freest economy ranking is falling because of increased corruption. Pan Democrats reject government's offer of concessions to break deadlock over political reform. Turkey reportedly reaches deal with Islamist militants to free Japanese hostage. Hong Kong has maintained its position as the world's freest economy again, although its overall score fell slightly because of perceived corruption, according to a U.S. think tank. But the ICAC has rejected the Heritage Foundation's assessment, insisting that Hong Kong is one of the least corrupt places in the world. ATV's An Jiang reports. Hong Kong has done it again. For the 21st straight year, it was awarded the accolade of the world's freest economy by the Conservative Heritage Foundation. The city beat 185 other economies to finish top of the pile with 89.6 points. That's 0.2 points more than Singapore, while New Zealand with 82.1 points was third. If we lose a little bit more, we may lose the number one position. So it's a good warning and the government and the, and, uh, and the whole society uh, should uh, prepare uh, for, uh, for next year. The SAR showed small improvements in business, labor and fiscal freedom. But its overall score was 0.5 points down from last year because it dropped points in the freedom from corruption section. That fell 7.3 points to 75, a record low since the handover. But the government said that was because of high-profile corruption cases last year. Last month, former Chief Secretary Raphael Hui and property tycoon Thomas Kwok were jailed after being convicted for misconduct in public office and bribery in the SAR's biggest graft case. And former Chief Executive Donald Tsung is waiting to hear whether he'll be prosecuted after being accused of accepting junkets from tycoons and spending public money lavishly on official foreign visits. In an unusual move, the ICAC responded to the Heritage Foundation ranking, saying the corruption score was a gauge of respondents' perception rather than the actual situation. The corruption watchdog said extensive media coverage of recent high-profile incidents, which it described as isolated cases, should not be seen as a sign of deterioration. On the contrary, the commission said these cases demonstrated the importance and effectiveness of the city's anti-corruption system. The ICAC added that its own survey last year showed only 1.5 percent of respondents came across corruption in the past 12 months, proving that it's not a big problem in Hong Kong. Anne Chang, ATV News. Pan-Democrat lawmakers have ridiculed a new bid by the government to break the stalemate over political reform. They're refusing to consider concessions for the 2022 chief executive election when the 2017 poll is being held under Beijing's restrictions. In a bid to break the deadlock over the city's political reform, government sources leaked a suggestion to the media last night that there may be room to adjust the electoral system for the 2022 chief executive poll if LegCo endorses its reform package for 2017. Officials are reportedly willing to promise to increase the number of chief executive candidates in 2022 from two or three to three or four and expand a 1,200-strong official nominating committee to 1,600 to 2,000 members. Some of the additional seats will be set aside for the youth sector to include those aged between 18 and 25 years. But the crucial element which triggered the 79-day Occupy protests last year remains unchanged. That is, the candidate can only make it on the ballot after securing the support of more than half of the nominating body. The news didn't go down well with pan-democratic lawmakers, who have already vowed to vote down any reform package that sticks to Beijing's restrictive framework. I don't think such rumors warrant any serious response at all. If there is anything good, I would expect the Central People's Government to come out in clearly articulated terms and engage Hong Kong people with it. The government officials dare not even come out to publicly make these statements and they have to hide behind sources. I mean, I'm not going to respond to sources. I think this is ridiculous. 
The Civic Party's Dennis Kwok also urged the government not to be so naive as to think Hong Kong people would accept or believe in what he called hollow promises. But Executive Council convener Lam Wun Kwong urged the pandemocrats not to impose their own wishes on Hong Kong people. Most of us want the whole uh, political reform to make progress in time. It may be too slow for some, but still, some progress is better than no progress at all. On a related matter, Kwa confirmed that he has been invited to the liaison office to its Lunar New Year reception on the 4th of February. He has decided to attend the function to express his opposition to a recent proposal to apply China's national security laws to Hong Kong. So I thought it would be a good occasion for me to go there and express very clearly the position of the Hong Kong people and the legal sector that such a proposal is ludicrous, it is unconstitutional. The ADPL's Frederick Fong argued that if Beijing's office here is genuine in its efforts to resume talks with the opposition camp on political reform, then all 70 lawmakers should be invited. DAB Chairman Tam Yu Chung is stepping down as leader of LegCo's biggest political party in March. The veteran Beijing loyalist says he wants to make way for young blood. ATV's Alison Chan reports. The leader of the largest political party in LegCo made this big announcement this morning. I will not be uh, to join to the uh, election of the uh, of the central committee. So, uh, so in the other words, that means I will be resigned from the uh, chairman's uh, uh, post. The veteran Beijing loyalist, who has been running the DAB for nearly eight years, plans to step down in March when the party re-elects its central committee. Also an executive councillor and a local delegate to the nation's top political advisory body, the 65-year-old said he's making way for new blood and is looking for younger members to succeed him. I found out that uh, uh, we have uh, quite a number of uh, our young generation, they have, they have uh, uh, to, to fulfill the post. Um, I found out that uh, I think it is a perfect time for me to uh, step down. Vice Chairwoman Starry Lee, also an executive councillor, is widely seen as a potential successor, but Tam would not talk about it today. He said he hasn't decided whether he would defend his seat in the LegCo elections next year. Alison Chan, ATV News. Police have arrested 10 people in connection with the theft of more than 3,000 smartphones from a Taipo warehouse last month. The suspects include a worker of a logistics company which owned the warehouse. It's believed he shipped most of the iPhone 5 sets to Singapore, Taiwan and the mainland through a paper recycling company. Officers recovered only a couple of the phones after searching five locations in the new territories. The government has warned it may revoke ATV's license for 30 days if it fails to pay fees owed to the Communications Authority by March deadline. The company is already in danger of losing its license permanently after repeatedly failing to pay staff on time. Winner Wong reports. Responding to concerns about ATV's financial problems, government officials gave lawmakers a clearer picture today. Filling in for the minister in charge of broadcasting, Acting Commerce Secretary Godfrey Leung explained that in addition to facing prosecution for repeatedly failing to pay staff wages on time, ATV is also in trouble over fees owed to the government. The Communications Authority has fined the station $200,000 for failing to pay the fixed fee for its free-to-air license and the annual fee for its fixed carrier license. ATV now owes the government $10.2 million. It's also the second time in three years this has happened, and Leung told lawmakers the authority considers it a serious breach of rules. ATV will now have to pay the amount owed in two installments in February and March, or the government may revoke its license for 30 days. Staff have yet to be paid their December salaries, and Executive Council convener Lam Wen Kuang slammed the company's major shareholder today for lending money to some employees instead of paying them. I've been in public service for 40 years, and I've never heard of anything so ridiculous, he said. But when asked whether Exco could revoke ATV's license, he would only say he had not received any information regarding the matter. The license expires in November, and the government is supposed to give the station a year's notice if it decides not to renew it. Winnawong, ATV News.
Overseas negotiators have reportedly reached a deal for a Japanese journalist held hostage by Islamic State to be swapped for an Iraqi woman bomber. The reported breakthrough came hours after the mother of hostage Kenji Goto made an emotional appeal for his life, saying he's not an enemy of Islam. His kidnappers had threatened in a video message to kill Goto and a captured Jordanian pilot in 24 hours. Islamic State demanded that Jordan release the woman blamed for 60 deaths in a bomb attack in Amman in 2005. Unconfirmed reports say Jordan has agreed to release the woman, paving the way for Islamic State to free Goto within hours. Tech giant Apple has smashed market expectations by posting record profit of 18 billion U.S. dollars, the biggest in corporate history. Earnings were driven by huge demand for its new iPhone, especially in China where sales went up 70 percent. The naysayers are eating their words once more, as Apple has done it again. The American tech giant's revenue rose to 74.6 billion U.S. dollars in its first financial quarter from 57.6 billion dollars a year ago. At a whopping $18 billion, net profit was the biggest that any public company has ever reported. Apple is now sitting on a cash pile of $178 billion, enough to pay $556 to every American citizen. And it's mostly thanks to the latest version of the flagship iPhone. CEO Tim Cook described the demand as staggering. The tech giant sold more than 74 million iPhones in the three months to the end of December, with earnings in China surging 70 percent because of strong demand for the biggest sized iPhone 6 Plus model. Apple's partnership with China Mobile, the world's biggest service provider, has enabled it to succeed in the massive but highly competitive mainland market and it's expecting to make even bigger bucks during the Lunar New Year holiday season. The one downside it reported was an 18 percent drop in sales of its iPad, which analysts say could be the company's own fault, as consumers are going for iPhones with bigger screens instead of the tablet device.